but everyone's always welcome here. You know that our door is wide open. You know, it's interesting. Life has often been portrayed as walking down a road. I remember one of my favorite songs growing up as a young boy was James Taylor's, Walking Down a Country Road. Guess my feet just know where they want me to go, walking on a country road. And I want you and I to join in on a couple of people that are walking down a country road this morning as we look into the scriptures. And I'll be looking at Luke chapter 24. We're going to be starting in verse 13 this morning, Luke 24, 13. So if you'd like to pause me for a second and grab a Bible, open up the scriptures. If you already have your Bible with you, feel free to. But I'm going to be coming out of Luke chapter 24, verses 13 and following. This is interesting because this is Easter afternoon that we're looking at here in Scripture. You know, some people say, well, Easter was last Sunday and Easter is gone now. We continue on with our regular lives. But a true Easter experience is something that continues on each and every day because we serve a risen Savior. And knowing that, we can walk with the resurrected Christ every single day and be with Him in our lives. Verse 13 tells us, now the same day, two of them, these were two of Jesus' disciples, two of his followers, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Just by way of a little side note, I think it's interesting that they are seven miles from Jerusalem. Again, that number seven pops up on the biblical page, the number of completion, the number of perfection, the number of fulfillment. They're walking there, and as they're talking to each other about everything that had happened, the scripture says, <coughs> excuse me, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. You know, God can have a way of cloaking himself sometimes so that he is not recognized. And here Jesus comes along and is walking with them, but they don't recognize him, that it's him. And it says, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Well, Jesus knows everything. God knows everything. He is omniscient, as theologians tell us, all-knowing about everything. He knows what they're talking about, but he asked them a question to start a dialogue going back and forth. Scripture says then, they stood still, with their faces downcast. Wow. Jesus comes to them and finds them in a depressed state. They're sad. Their faces are downcast. You know, when a person is really feeling low, when something bad has happened, they tend to have their eyes looking toward the ground. They're not looking up. They're looking down. And they're downcast. They're very sad because of something that had happened. And it says, as they stood with their faces downcast, one of them named Cleophas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. I believe God has such a sense of humor, folks. I really do. What things? He's in charge of everything. He knows everything. But he asked them a question again to keep the dialogue going. Cleophas says, about Jesus of Nazareth, they reply, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. They recognize that Jesus is a prophet, but I don't believe they've come to the full understanding of who he really is, God incarnate, God in the flesh, as John tells us in his gospel. John said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the Word was made God. And then in John 1, 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They recognized he was a prophet, but they hadn't come to the full realization of who Jesus really was. He was a prophet, they say, powerful in word and deed. He spoke strongly. He did miracles before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers, that would have been the Roman authorities, handed him over to be crucified, sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. 
Why was Cleophas and the other disciple downcast? Why were they saddened about what then happened? They had a dream, they had an ideal, and that dream had died. That dream was kind of really short-sighted when you kind of look at it in a way. They were only looking at this life. They were only looking at circumstances. And they had hoped that Jesus was going to be a deliverer of Israel that would throw off the rope of Yom, get rid of Rome's political power, and restore Israel to the way it had been back during the time of David and Solomon. When Israel was prominent among the nations and not underneath the boot heel of a Roman emperor. That's what they were hoping for, and that's the kind of savior they were looking for, a political savior. So they were really short-sighted in their goal, and because their goal had died, their dream had died, they're downcast. Folks, have you ever had a dream die? Have you ever had something that you really wanted to happen that didn't materialize? Perhaps you had a good friendship with somebody, and in time, that friend let you down. They were no longer there for you. People promised you something and didn't come through with a promise. We've all been let down. We've all had dreams die. We've all had circumstances where things have gone against us and has caused us to be down and, 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 and depressed about that sort of thing. But often if we take the time to stand back with time, we can realize that often that dream is short-sighted. Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> Okay, now let's go on in the text. It says, what is more, listen to this, it is the third day since all this took place. Remember, Jesus was, was crucified on Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday, the three days, okay? Then the third day, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So not only are they short-sighted, they're confused about these reports that the women went to the tomb and didn't find anything. Folks, you know what I think is really interesting to see? The women were the first witnesses of the resurrection and the resurrected Christ. The ladies that went to anoint his body with spices, it was ladies who first saw the resurrection and came back and reported that to the disciples. So God wants to use women just as much as he uses men, and he values both in his economy as people that are made in the image of God. After Jesus hears Cleophas's definition, he realizes that they're sad because they were short-sighted and confused. He said to them, how foolish you are, <clears throat> excuse me, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. He tells them, gosh, you guys are really foolish and you're slow of heart to believe what the prophets have said. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Some translations say he opened the scriptures to them and then explained all that was said concerning himself. The first thing Jesus opens up to them is the word of God. And I guarantee if you seek God and if you open up the scriptures, you'll find God in the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now look closely at verse 30. This is really exciting. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. What does that remind you of? When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. The same way he's doing that here, he's doing that with these disciples. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then, 31, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and poof, he disappeared from their sight. The first thing Jesus opened up to them was the scriptures. He opened up the word of God, Moses and all the prophets. 
Then he opened up their eyes and they recognized it was Jesus. And poof, he vanished. Isn't that really cool that God has the power to do that? Well, with God as God, with God, all things are possible. And Jesus just vanishes after they see him and recognize him. And they're just sitting there completely and totally blown away. With their eyes, they have seen the resurrected Christ. Let's go up and see what they did after this, okay? <clears throat> they asked each other, verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They talk about their hearts burning within them. Folks, when you open up the word of God and when you ask God to open up your eyes and then you look into the scriptures, it'll really cause your heart to burn and God will open up your heart. There's a beautiful praise song that we sing these days. It says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. And that's a really good song to sing, for God to open the eyes of our heart. A song yet also a prayer involved in the song. So their hearts burn within them, and what are they going to do? They're going to go tell somebody else. Look what happens here at verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, back the way they went. There they found the 11. Notice there's only 11 of the original 12 disciples, because by this time Judas had gone out and hanged himself and committed suicide over the guilt of betraying Jesus. So there's only 11 of them there. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. It's true. It's all true. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Notice the first thing they do is they go and share work of God that they had experienced. Folks, if you allow God to open up the scriptures before you, if you allow God to open up your eyes and then open the eyes of your heart to see, you'll have something to share because you'll see the hand of God working in your life. I think many of you right now could stand up and share and give a testimony of what God is doing lately in your life. I think of us coming back into the sanctuary for our Easter Sunday service it was so good. We had a beautiful sunrise service at Mary Wisham Park earlier that day. God is at work and God is constantly at work around us. And if you open your eyes, open the Bible, and open your heart to the Lord, you will see his work in your life. Remember what Jesus said? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you'll see God's hand in your work. Keep your eyes closed. Keep your Bible closed. I guarantee your heart will be closed. But if you open your eyes and you open the word, God will open your heart. And I guarantee you'll see his footprints as clearly as you can see something physically. Why? God is alive and well. Now, here comes the icing on the cake. You know, I love cake. I do. I love to eat cake. And I especially love to eat cake with real thick icing. Chocolate fudge icing. Mm. That and some vanilla ice cream, and I'm floating my boat. I really am. Now look, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to you, Peace be unto you. Typical biblical greeting of that time. Peace be unto you, and someone would respond, and to you, peace. You'll hear sometimes on TV, if you're looking about a news clip about Israel, they say, Shalom Alechem, peace to you. And the other person says, Alechem Shalom, to you peace. Gives a normal biblical greeting here. Peace be unto you. Look at this, their reaction. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. It's a ghost. What are we going to do? Same way they thought about Jesus when they were out on the sea and Jesus came to them walking on the water. It's a ghost. And the scripture says they were totally frightened. That's what happens here. It's a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Let me ask you a question this morning. 
Why are you troubled? What is bothering you? What's on your mind that's kind of eating away at you? Why are you troubled? Let's go on. Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your mind? Jesus says, look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, the resurrected Christ in all his glory. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. He's standing right there in front of him, and they think it's a ghost, but he says, look, I am in a resurrected body. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. You know, some people have the false assumption that when you die, you just become a spirit, and you float up into the clouds, you dance with the angels, and you play a harp on a cloud with a little old fat, pudgy angel, or something like that. No. Scripture promises bodily resurrection. You and I will receive a brand new body that's resurrected. I love what Job says back in Job chapter 19. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives and shall stand on the earth in the latter day. And though my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Job looked forward to a literal bodily resurrection. And you and I can look forward to the same when we look forward to being with the Lord for all eternity. God will create a new heavens and a new earth, be just like this earth here except perfect, and will be perfect in a resurrected body. Now he's going to prove something to them. Verse 40, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, and this is too good to be true. This is literally Jesus. They still are not believing because of joy and amazement. He said, hey, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. I don't think Jesus did this just because he was hungry. He did this to show them that he was in a resurrected body, and in a resurrected body you still eat. Some scholars believe it might have been Mrs. Paul's fish sticks that he ate. But I think it's probably over some broiled fish that the disciples made for him, okay? They didn't know he was coming, but they made it. And he ate this broiled fish to show, I'm in a real body, I'm here, here's my hands, here's my feet, and look, I'll even eat a piece of fish. Which is a good promise for us that we will eat in our resurrected bodies. Remember Revelation talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb? And think about what good times we've had over meals with family and friends. We'll enjoy the same kind of thing in heaven with God for all eternity, I truly believe. He said to them, verse 44, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The threefold division of the Hebrew Bible, the law, the prophets, and the writings sometimes referred to as the Psalms. This is what happened. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. Again, Jesus opened something else up. First, he opened up the Scriptures. Then he opened up their eyes. Then their hearts burned within them. He opened the eyes of their hearts. And now again here, he is opening their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. You have to have the Holy Spirit illuminate you enlighten you to rightly understand the Word of God. He told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and there he is living proof of it. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. Remember Cleophas and the other disciple on the road to Emmaus? They had a real short-sighted goal and were very confused when that dream died. A very short-sighted dream of just having Rome's yoke thrown off of Israel and Israel being free as a country. A momentary, a small thing in the midst of eternity. God had something much bigger in mind. God's dreams are so much bigger and fuller than any dream you and I would ever have. And he said, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations. And look how that has come true even in our day here today. 
We preach forgiveness of sins through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. We preach repentance that you change your mind about the way you were living and you choose to make an effort to live differently. You change your ways. You repent of your sins. You receive forgiveness. And then Jesus goes on in the next verse to say, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. He says, stay in the city and wait, because I'm going to send you something special that's really going to give you power. But when does that happen? In a few weeks, we'll see on the day of Pentecost. Jesus had told him in Acts chapter 1 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem, and to all the corners of the earth. They were going to receive the divine power of the Holy Spirit to fill them, to control them, so they could go out and share the gospel message of the resurrected Christ. Folks, we serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men might say. I hear his voice of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within our hearts. And as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a message to share. So don't let Easter just be a holiday that's already happened last week and has passed away and you Go on with your life and your plans and think about your summer vacation or whatever you have coming up. Realize that Easter is the beginning of a whole new phase in life, a life and a walk with the resurrected Christ. Share what God is doing in your soul. Share the gospel message as often as you have opportunity. Share with somebody else what God is doing in your life. If you'll if you open the scriptures up, if you'll open your eyes up, if you open your mind up and let God open the scriptures before you, your heart will burn and you'll walk with God just like Cleophas and another disciple on the road to Emmaus. And while you're on the roads here in Interlochen, your heart will feel that burning and that warmth. Share what you have. It's not yours until you give it away. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the walk to Emmaus, and I thank you, too, for the movement walk to Emmaus that many of the Methodist churches observe. And thank you so much that we do have a living Savior who completely amazed his disciples when he appeared to them in a brand new resurrected body. And thank you, Father, for the evidence he gave that he was there, he was real, and the resurrection was certainly true. Father, how we look forward to the day when we wake up in glory and look around and say, it's all true. Just like you said, Lord, it's here and it's true. Help us as we go forth, Father, to share the message. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. And excuse me, I had a little bit of a cold and things like that. But the Lord carried me through and the Lord will carry you through no matter what you're afflicted with too. Stay in the Word. It's the safest place.